<laughs> well, this should teach me not to open my fat fucking mouth. If you recall, back in early to mid-2017, I made a series retrospective on Star Fox called the Star Fox Fathon. Your definitive Star Fox review series, etc, etc, and the one game that I really skimped out on was Star Fox 2, because how do you really talk in depth about a game that was never technically released? You don't know what was in the leaked ROM that may or may not have been part of the intended experience, so it's like reviewing the living conditions of an almost completed but abandoned apartment building. Sure, it may almost appear to be completed, but who knows how much more work needed to be done for it to get to saleable standards, but then Nintendo, selfish as they are, decided to release the game officially. How dare you make my review of an unfinished game? Uh, unfinished. But you guys don't really care, do you? You just want to hear me talk about a game from 1995 that came out in 2017 like we're all living in a filler episode of Doctor Who. Now, I'm sure you're all aware of the history of Star Fox 2, and if not, strap in. It was one of, if not the most high-profile game cancellation in history when Nintendo decided to pull the plug on the completed game and opted not to release it because they wanted to have a gap between high-profile 3D games before the release of the Nintendo 64, then called the Ultra 64, but it was all for naught because the N64 ended up being delayed so it was cancelled for nothing. As well, Nintendo didn't want Star Fox 2 to be unfavorably compared to any PS1 or Sega Saturn games as both consoles were released around the time that Star Fox 2 was set to come out. However, that's when shit really hit the R-Wing, because Argonaut Software, who made both Star Fox 1 and 2 and owned the rights to the Super FX chip, the technology that made both games possible, but the IP and characters were both owned by Nintendo, both Star Fox 1 and 2 were caught in a legal grey area between Argonaut Software and Nintendo, which was an absolute mess and a headache just to think about. I don't even fully understand how it works myself because law is dumb. Also, fun fact, to my knowledge, this is why Star Fox 1 was never released digitally on the eShop and why it never got a port to the GBA, while something like Yoshi's Island, which also used the Super FX chip, did. Because that game was made by Nintendo as opposed to a third party like Star Fox was, as long as they ported it without the use of the Super FX chip or any of the coinciding code, they were golden legally. As for Star Fox 2, it lingered in obscurity for many years with only unfinished ROM leaks to show us what could have been. That was until the surprise announcement and subsequent scalping of the Super Nintendo Classic, where Nintendo not not only got Star Fox on it, but also the fabled completed ROM of Star Fox 2. So my first thought was, yay, followed by, damn it. So let's go back to 2017 to review a game from 1995 released in 2017 in 2018. And see if Star Fox 2 holds up, and see if it passes the nostalgia test. It's funny though, I may or may not have done the exceedingly easy, like, five-step process of hacking my SNES Classic to make the price tag more worth it, and so in turn, I may or may not have added over 200 new games to it. Including this. Every day we stray further from God. So this game opens up and- Okay, I'm having deja vu. This is eerily familiar to the beta ROM that was leaked. Mostly because right from the opening cutscene, this is essentially the beta frame for frame. If this game is as similar to the leaked ROM as I have a feeling it will be, it's gonna be very hard to decipher what was or wasn't changed or added for the final version. In any case, as most of you know, Star Fox was the game that introduced us to the Super FX chip, a groundbreaking piece of tech that at the time allowed the Super Nintendo to render 3D polygons, as quaint as that may seem now. It's clear from the outset that Argonaut and Nintendo wanted to continue pushing the limits of the Super Nintendo beyond what was conventionally thought possible for the system. To that end, this game looks very impressive even from the opening cutscene. Opening cutscenes were very rare in this stage in gaming, and so this was a treat, and it was probably only put in to show off the technology, and for what it's worth, this game does look impressive, but I hesitate to use the word good. As cool as a novelty as it was to have these polygons on screen, it doesn't do much to distract from the fact that the color palette is very flat and very bland. It's a neat style, and there are good environments here and there, but this is the Atari 2600 equivalent of 3D, and it strikes me as less of a visual style and more of a, this is all we could really do with the hardware. I think it really was a case of, they were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop and think if they should. There is an appeal to the contrasting stark flat colors and the simple designs, and I could understand why someone could really like this style, and I really appreciate how it's immediately visually apparent what's an enemy, and furthermore, what's an enemy's weak point. I'll concede that the 2D art is really good when they do 2D art, such as with the character portraits and the map, and there are some really cool looking designs of things like missiles and boss fights. I'm assuming with the low poly count, 
they had to make certain things look outlandish so they immediately look distinct compared to everything else, I think this game looks roughly on par with Star Fox 1, if not slightly better, and that is to say impressive and passable by the standards of the time, but by no means good. But then again, it's the type of thing that you may have to have an appreciation for to get the full effect, because whether or not it was the only way to make it, there is at least a clear art style compared to some PS1 and N64 games. I guess what I'm trying to say is the graphics are a mixed bag, and there is something here, but it really is up to the eye of the beholder, and so while I could see an appeal to the graphics in Star Fox 2 and how it looks more advanced than Star Fox 1, I'm not the biggest fan, but I'm especially not a fan of what pushing the hardware beyond the limit like this does to the frame rate. This might be a problem with the SNES Mini as opposed to the actual game, but seeing as no official cartridge actually exists for this game... Wrong again, TGX. If you're willing to pay someone to destroy a copy of Stunt Race FX, you can get your very own reproduction cart for the low, low price of 50 US dollars. All it'll take is six months to deliver it. And it was totally worth it to play the game in 20 FPS on real hardware, complete with authentic dithering. In fact, if you sample the RGB signal correctly, you can even perform a 10 times upscale to 4K. <laughs> Yixo Paradigm Gamar, how dare you show up on my video uninvited, and enough with the techno babble. I've had enough on my plate lately without having to deal with unauthorized cameos like this. Besides, I said this game was never officially released on physical media. Yeah, but I can't say I expected this game to get an official release at all. I spent a lot of money and waited months for this card to show up only for the real version to come out within a year on SNES Mini. What are you even doing here? I thought you were making a video on Luigi's Mansion, or Luigi's Panini, or Luigi's used car down payment or something. Oh, I've been here a while, plotting my revenge for your wretched slander of war gods for the N64, the greatest game ever made. Exo, enough of this. If you don't get out of here right now, I'm gonna have to do something that neither of us want. <gasps> You don't mean... I'll have to break out the Weave Deinterlaced 480i gameplay footage! <laughs> Get it away! You win this round, TGX, but mark my words, the War Gods fanbase will have our revenge. Just you wait and see. <laughs> You're still on about that? Seriously? Seeing as no official cartridge actually exists for this game, I have no point of comparison. With that said, at any given time when you're in combat, this game tanks. It tanks harder than a trip to Titania, but um, tish. Okay, that's a landmaster, but you get my point. In the menus and the map, the game runs at a silky smooth 60, but I could probably count on one hand the number of frames per second I'm seeing in some of these combat sections. The problem here is that in Star Fox 1, the game only really rendered the immediate space in front of you, whereas this game attempts to render full environments at a higher quality than before, and so this game at times has an unforgivably bad frame rate. I'm not one of those people who will say either it's 60 FPS or higher, otherwise I'm not buying, but even I have my limits and this exceeds them. This is an unacceptably bad frame rate for any generation, regardless of the context surrounding the game. It would be like releasing a YouTube video at 5 FPS. Oh crap. But this is all wallpaper on the actual experience of the game. While a shoddy frame rate and mixed bag graphics can take away from an experience, quality ultimately shines through, and for what it's worth, I do think this game is really damn fun to play. Mostly. It's funny, of all the Star Fox games, Star Fox 2 is one of the more ambitious ones because this one defies genre more than probably any game in the series. So it's like a combination of a multi-directional shooter, real-time strategy, flight simulator, third-person shooter platformer hybrid, and I'm probably forgetting something. So the ambition wasn't just in the graphics, and it pays off for the most part. You start off in the menu picking the characters you wish to choose for this playthrough, you pick a main man and a wingman you can swap out for. You can choose from the original four, Fox, Falco, Peppy, and Slippy, but this game introduces Miu, a Lynx, and Faye, either a poodle or a cocker spaniel. More on them later. In practical terms, each character has different stats and different special items, which adds replayability to see who's the best to use in certain situations. From there, you make your way to the main game on the map. Now I'm gone. This is all 
you being represented by these R-Wing icons. The real-time strategy element comes into play when you have to defend Corneria from oncoming hazards, armadas of spacecraft, missiles, etc. While protecting Corneria, you have to make your way to battle carriers and occupied planets and destroy Andros's forces and weaken his grasp on the system enough to take him head on. In terms of atmosphere, it nails the feeling of going into a battle you're completely unprepared for, only just being able to hold on as wave after wave of hazards come for you. You may think you have time to take out that planet, but if you misjudge your timing, that's a few precious percent of Corneria's health gone that you can't get back, and if it reaches 100%, game over. No do-overs, this game is 100% permadeath like an early FTL. It gets very hairy, especially in the harder game modes. It almost makes you feel trapped in an endless loop of defending your turf, which makes it all the more satisfying when you do have an opening to take out a major part of Andros's armada. Or optionally, you can just cheese defense and take out a part of Andros's armada, letting Corneria take the hit, which is a risk worth weighing the pros and cons of. You have all of the time in the world to figure out your next move, because while this game is real-time when in motion, it doesn't move until you do. But unlike most games with similar gameplay setups to this where the game pauses while you're in the main game, not here. You see that timer at the top of the screen? That's your timer that will affect the main overall game. If you take too long while freeing a planet or taking out a command ship, you're wasting time that you'll need to defend Corneria, and Pepper will constantly be in your ear non-stop pressuring you. So you could be taking out an important base but be sacrificing Corneria for the time being. You come out of the mission and then suddenly, boom. Ow! It's this balancing act that makes the game organically tense and exciting, and that's just a bonus on top of how the main game actually plays. The actual gameplay is split into a few modes. You have full 360 degree dogfighting when fighting other ships, missiles, or occasionally military installations in space, and open 3D levels where you have to infiltrate and destroy military installations. The dogfights control pretty much identically to Star Fox 1, from the shooting to the dodging, etc. The major difference is that, at least in this mode, the third person view is useless and the cockpit view is claustrophobic, but it's the only useful one. One thing that's conspicuously absent is true on-rails shooter action. The closest you get is when you're infiltrating the command ships, you have to fly at them while they throw everything they have at you, but that's it. You can press select in 3D levels and go into R-Wing mode at any time, but this isn't true rail shooter gameplay, it's just the same open 3D level but while flying instead of walking. I'm not gonna complain about it being different, but I do think that this game worked better on rails because the only way to move around in these open levels are using the D-pad, aka using a 2D interface for 3D space, which is awkward. The dogfighting is good, but it can't be better. My main issue is that there's no lock-on, and so it's very easy for enemies to get away. If you have more than three or four people you need to take out at once, it's oftentimes easier to just throw a bomb in there and take out at least most of them at once, because time is of the essence. Otherwise, the dogfighting is as mechanically good as it can be. You move around a combat arena and shoot bogeys. It's functional, and the sounds and visual effects make the combat satisfying. There's really nothing else to say. It's great mechanically. It is, at the very base level, a fun game to play. It's just hard to really get to that point. I had a few false starts because because this game throws you right into the action, and it's complex enough to take a bit of getting used to. I was having trouble with the field of view, because there are people all around you, and it's not immediately obvious where they are in relation to you, especially since it's a full 360 degree arena with a 2D map, and so they tried to do a little bit too much with not enough. Plus, the low res graphics means that depth is a little bit hard to perceive, and it's not easy to tell which direction enemies are moving in sometimes. Another key example of this is how the shooting's a bit finicky. The problem of enemy location and depth means that it can be tough to predict where to preemptively shoot. It's it's also a bit weird because you don't have a static reticle, it's one that moves all over the screen as you do, but it doesn't move past a certain point so it's a bit finicky, but these nitpicks don't really affect the overall enjoyment too much. It may sound like I'm trashing the game, but there's really only so many ways you can say it's fun to shoot the thing. It's one note gameplay done right, and the games are short and built for replayability so it doesn't wear out its welcome and encourages you to come back and play it again and again. In fact, this game even has a score system so you always have something to top, and you get higher scores for higher difficulty which is a good risk reward system. You can go harder to get a better score, but then it's more likely that you'll get overwhelmed. Oh, that's a good score. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. See. 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 Ant. But we get ahead of ourselves. The second major game mode is the aforementioned full 3D sections where you take control of the walker. This mechanic that's featured in Star Fox 2 from 1995 debuted in Star Fox Zero in 2016. Yeah, wrap your head around that. Once again, they tried too much with not enough, and as a result, it becomes, once again, a bit finicky. You turn with the shoulder buttons and aim with the D-pad. It's about as good as you could expect given the technology, and the shooting feels just as good as it did in the dogfights. While in the open-ended areas, you don't have as much going on at any given time, because by their very nature, the hazards are more spread out. Normally, these 
these sections are twofold, exterior and interior. The exterior sections are usually spent trying to get inside, and that's down to finding and pressing switches to open a door, and inside you take out a base, and some levels start inside, so that's where most of the gameplay in these sections take place. From the inside, you take out enemies and move through a facility and fight a boss. I like the walker sections, it feels more epic and vast, in such a way that a 2D game wouldn't be able to pull off. The shooting has a lot more weight to it, the controls are fairly responsive, and the navigation is intuitive for the most part. There was one point where I wasn't sure where to go and had to discover through trial and error that I had to backtrack through several rooms to kill all enemies before the door would open, but that was a one-time thing that I just needed to discover, and Corneria took some damage as a result of me taking so long, so my bad. These sections are pretty good pretty much for the same reasons as the standard gameplay is. It's a much more methodical mode because walking around isn't as fast as flying, but it still works really well. The highlight for me was where I was supposed to find a switch, but to my chagrin, the switch was attached to a really powerful enemy and a sudden fight ensued. The game is filled with these little moments where it takes you by surprise, but in a good way. A great compliment to the permadeath gameplay. So both the walker mode and the dogfight mode are pretty damn good. Neither reached the heights of the likes of Star Fox 1, but in terms of experimentation, this game has a lot of upside in spite of some flawed top-heavy design. There's a really good progression as well. As you take out Andross's army, he doesn't just sit around and let you ransack his army, he starts to get desperate and sends out the big guns in the form of bosses such as this giant space snake dragon thing called the Mirage Dragon. Oh my god! It's a Mirage! who's a giant chump all things considered. Tektron was another one, and he was a bit more obnoxious because you need to dodge his shot, but because I can't dodge without losing him as I'm not on a 2D plane, I ended up just tanking the hits. But more often, he sends Star Wolf. Some members of Star Wolf will show up when you try and take a planet, but Wolf is at the very least Andross's last resort. These are probably my favorite part of the game because they're pure dogfights and are just down to you and your skill. And also luck when hitting them with charge shots, more on that in a minute. Hey look, it's Leon. Who the fuck are you? These fights get very hairy too, they can easily outwit you and drag you to the brink of death, and you don't heal up after the mission's over either. You can swap out to your wingman, but that's only a band-aid over a bullet wound. The only way for you to heal up is to return to your command ship, but then you're wasting precious time that could cost Corneria more health, which adds another layer of depth onto Star Fox 2. This game is all about weighing the pros and cons of pushing forward and taking the hit, or borrowing time from the future and risking the health of Corneria. The future's in your hands, and you're responsible for keeping this operation afloat, whatever it takes. It gets that balance down pat, so it's constantly tense and rewarding when you do succeed at taking out a fleet while keeping Corneria safe, but you never feel safe, and it's a tension that weighs on you like a hippo on a school child. It's never ending, and a bit traumatic. I'd say this real-time aspect really elevates what would have otherwise been a really humdrum Star Fox experience, and I'd say the soundtrack really adds to that a lot as well. I wouldn't necessarily say that there are any standout tracks, but they're all really good and have a nice rock techno tune to them. We're still dealing with MIDI music at this point in gaming, so while the quality could be much better, they squeezed every ounce of quality they could out of it. They're very melodious tracks that carry the atmosphere of battle, that is to say that they're very intense. I especially liked the menu music. It has a very ominous sound, like we're stepping into something we're completely ill-prepared for, which is pretty much the game in a nutshell. The soundtrack is great. Do I have other issues? Well, the bosses while you're playing as the walker are very repetitive. It's just strafe and shoot almost every time with no depth whatsoever, even in Andross's first stage. There was the heavy chariot that required a bit more skill, but that was more of a nuisance than anything. That's all it is. Secondly, there are a few things that were changed between the beta and the official release, but one of the oddest changes is that they took away the lock-on when you fully charge your laser. That seems incredibly arbitrary. Why would they do this? It's already hard enough to gauge distance and exact enemy placement without you taking away my only ace in the hole. Most enemies die in a few hits anyway, so without the benefit of lock-on, there's not even really a reason to have charge shots. It just seems like a lot of time in combat to devote to something that might not even hit. Sure, they make quick work of bosses, but once again, that's only if you can hit them. It just seems like a really odd thing to take away in terms of general flaws. The lesser known cousin to General Pepper. I've heard that apparently the lock-on is an additional unlock if you collect all the General Pepper coins, but that still seems like a very odd thing to lock away. That would be like taking away the ability to pause and then making it an optional unlock. The story of this game isn't really worth talking about, it's basically an obligatory narrative to frame the action. Andross returns apropos of nothing and declares war on Corneria. That's it. 
However, the online manual does fill in a lot of the blanks and puts forth a deeper story than is actually presented in the game, like how Andros sacked several planets before any retaliation could be formed and so that's why most of the Lilat system is Andros's territory before the game starts. Classic telling without showing. Classic! You see what I did there? It's not much more depth, but it does give you several more details. They hired two new people from the Cornarian army, the previously established Fei and Miyu. They say it's because they were the most skilled people for the job, but personally, I think it's because Star Fox had to fulfill a diversity quota for tax reasons. I'm kidding, obviously, don't shoot me. What's funny about these characters is that they're pretty big characters amongst the Star Fox traditionalists. Let me explain. The Star Fox fanbase is pretty much split right down the middle between traditionalists and modern fans. You have traditionalists who are pretty much only fans of everything before adventures, whereas more modern fans vary, but are more inclined to liking more modern games. The differentiation between who's a traditionalist and who's a more modern fan can be determined by one question. Who do you like better, Crystal or Miu slash Fei? Because most traditional fans will say that Crystal Crystal was a key component for ruining the series. Personally, I like Crystal more, but only because Miyu slash Faye don't really have personalities, and for many years they weren't even technically real. That's the thing that confuses me, is how hate aside, anybody could like Miyu slash Faye more, because at the very least, Crystal has a discernible personality, whereas these characters only existed in one game, and it had very little dialogue to speak of, so they only have a few moments of personality building. It wouldn't be hard to make them better than Crystal, but at the moment, they aren't. Point is, I find it perplexing how popular they are among amongst some of the fans, and how great some people say they are, even though they're blank slates. Funny thing though, I do remember reading a webcomic some time ago that had Miyu and Fei in it, and it actually did do justice to these characters, but I can't seem to find it anymore. I thought it was Lilat Legacy, but apparently I was wrong, and I can't seem to find what I'm looking for. The visual I remember was a page with Fei being scolded by Falco, with what looked like a desert planet as a backdrop. Anyway, I got off topic. To be fair, they do show a little bit of personality, Miyu comes across as flirtatious, but also is described as a tomboy, and believe believes the best defense is a good offense. We've had a good offense, and Corneria's been getting blown to shit! What war have you been fighting? And Faye comes across as cheery and eager, like somebody on their first day on the job. She also is apparently part of an aristocratic family, not that that comes up at all. It's not much, but it does the job, though I did see some art of her one time with a flamethrower, which was badass. The other never-before-seen character in this game that took me by surprise was a member of Star Wolf named Algy. Algy? Really? <laughs> Might as well have named him Moss. Also, it may interest you to know that Algy was also a nerd character from Bully. He's characterized as a ruthless psychotic who enjoys exploiting weaknesses and does so with precision. He'd make a good politician. I'd like to see him brought back with some more expansion. He has potential to be a really cool character, especially with his weird robotic design, but as of now, that potential hasn't been paid off. Otherwise, the dialogue is kept to a minimum, and most characters come across as their generally generic selves. Fox generically heroic, Andross and Star Wolf generically evil, etc. Wolf, though, is pretty cool because he appears in his pre Star Fox 64 design with a scar as opposed to an eye patch, plus, he has the tendency to drone on about nothing. <laughs> Okay, I get it. Best pilot in the galaxy. Now hold still so I can blow the shit out of you. It's funny too how even after you beat Wolf, he continues to talk at you even as his ship is critically damaged. Well, he is right here. Let's take him out before the rest of the series can happen. Stop monologuing and blow up already, you bastard! Other than that, a lot of what can be perceived as story is emergent. You fight and struggle through Andros's forces before taking him on, and it's incredibly rewarding to make your way to Andros and after everything he's done, take him out. It's a good mix of gameplay and is a fantastic payoff and challenge for everything you've learned up to this point. It starts out as you making your way through the hardest facility in the game as the Walker, and then you make it to Andros and fight him at first as the Walker, and then you fight him in what looks like a throwback to the first game's final boss, taking out his eyes, opening up the mask to the Andros cube, and finishing him off with a BOOM! And that was Star Fox 2. For real this time. This one has a lot going for it, but it also has a lot working against it. What I think is unfortunate is that the game has a lot going for it, but it tries to cram too much into too small of a space. Failed ambition is still better than successful blandness, but it really did feel like they needed to slow down and work on polishing individual aspects of the gameplay before experimenting with others and doing too much too soon. They should have also really considered the Super Nintendo's capabilities. Sure, it's admirable that you wanted to push the technology to new heights, but when that's at the expense of the player experience, it's worth scaling back a bit. 
work on optimization and performance over total graphical power. Nobody's gonna fault you for that. Well, in theory, anyway. In the end, Star Fox 2 is an enjoyable but flawed experience that's aged poorly. Strange saying that about a game that came out in 2017. It's on the lower tier of Star Fox, but it's not the worst, nor is it by any means a bad game. It's still fun to play, but has a good portion of chaff between you and the fun. So does Star Fox 2 pass the nostalgia test? Yes. It's a bit of a mixed bag, this one, but it is better than the sum of its parts. However, now that we've had a several year gap, a reimagining, and a release to a timeline that was rebooted in the late 90s, what even is the Star Fox timeline now? This video was brought to you in part by my lovely patrons. I thank you for your continued support. If you want to become a patron for TGX, the link is in the description. Well, he's right here. Let's take him out before the rest of the series. Fuck you. I said official, numbnuts. Get over it. No, get it away, get it away! It's almost as bad as watching TGX try to review a plot in a Crash Bandicoot game for 20 minutes. <laughs>